Good evening. evening. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 20th annual Frank M. Coffin Lecture on Law and Public Service. Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Peter Pittagoff. I'm Dean of the University of Maine School of Law. There are so many distinguished guests here tonight, I won't even begin to name them, but I do want to make a special welcome to Ruth Coffin, sitting in the front row. We're honored this evening to welcome Jeffrey Lehman as our distinguished Coffin lecturer. Jeff Lehman is a leader in higher education in America and overseas. Uh, he's a leader in groundbreaking collaborations uh, with universities in China. And he's here tonight because his life and his career really reflect Judge Coffin's values of integrity, of excellence, of public service. In many ways, Jeff Lehman is a member of the extended Coffin family. Jeff was a clerk for Judge Coffin in 1981 to 1982 when he was chief judge of the US Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. As you know, the, and as many of you are members of, the community of Coffin clerks is, is a really impressive and diverse um, group of over 60 lawyers, judges, professors, and civic leaders. They helped to create this lecture series two decades ago, and they've stepped up to sustain the tradition and the spirit and the momentum of the lecture uh, series and to celebrate the values and the legacy of their mentor. The law school is proud to be the host of the annual Coffin Lecture. Judge Frank Coffin was a distinguished member of the judiciary, of course, and a had a very impressive career spanning all three branches of the federal government. But it's his rich personal relationships that so many of us remember and value so much. The Maine Law Review published a symposium issue last year dedicated to Judge Coffin's remarkable legacy. And the issue provides a, a glimpse into Judge Coffin's wisdom and his intelligence his commitment to social justice and his public service, his kindness, his wit. Peter Byrne, who actually just visited the law school uh, a week ago to do a workshop, is a former Coffin clerk and a longtime professor at Georgetown Law School. And he wrote in the Law Review, quote, Judge Coffin stirred the souls of many clerks through his example of professional attainment and public service harmonized with personal creativity, family, affection, and pervasive good humor. Many of us remember his signature introductions to the annual Coffin Lectures. And once again, the clerks have stepped up to support this lecture series with a new chapter of introductions by people who knew the judge so well. Uh, we're fortunate this evening that Margaret McGoy, uh, also a former clerk to Judge Coffin, uh, will introduce our lecturer. But before I introduce Margaret, uh, who will give Jeff a proper introduction, um, let me add a personal note. I've known Jeff Lehman for over 20 years. And early in his academic career, uh, he created the Urban Communities Program at the University of Michigan Law School, which was an innovative community development and affordable housing finance program in legal education and service. He named me to its advisory board. We worked closely together then, and we've stayed in touch ever since. So a little less than eight years ago, when I arrived in Maine, and I first met Judge Coffin, the very first words out of the judge's mouth to me were, Jeffrey Lehman. <laughs> so uh, Jeff must have uh, warned him that there was a new dean in town. Um, now, let me introduce the introducer. Margaret McGoy serves as appellate chief in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Maine. She was hired as assistant U.S. Attorney in 1978 by then U.S. Attorney George Mitchell, uh, and she's been appellate chief since 1985. Word has it that she's currently working on her 390th appeal. 390. That's 
It's a lot of appeals. Uh, Margaret earned her undergraduate degree with honors from Stanford and her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Early in her career, Margaret worked as a public defender at the Massachusetts Defenders Committee. And yes, she too was a clerk to Chief Judge Frank M. Coffin of the First Circuit. We're honored that she's here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Margaret McGoy. Thank you, Peter. Speaking of the Coffin clerks, anyone who has spent any time around us knows that we behave like a very large, sometimes rowdy group of siblings. <laughs> We're very fond of one another. We're quite loyal to one another. We tease each other absolutely relentlessly. But under all of this goodwill flows an undercurrent of sort of sibling rivalry. Each one of us secretly wants to be the favorite clerk. <laughs> we each want to do something that will make the judge and Ruth love us best. <laughs> now, I don't know, but I would guess that that is the reason Jeff Lehman accepted this speaking engagement. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something about him. He took his undergraduate degree at Cornell University where he walked away with all manner of distinction. He did the same at the University of Michigan School of Law, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review, magna cum laude, order of the qua. He then clerked for Judge Coffin. I can't resist pointing out that he clerked for the judge after I did, which means I got to the judge first. <laughs> One clerkship led to another. He clerked for Associate Justice John Paul Stevens of the Supreme Court of the United States. He did a brief stint in private practice, and then the light went on. He realized his real calling was teaching. So he went back to his alma mater, the University of Michigan, where he was a professor of law and then dean of the law school. From there, he went to Cornell, where again, he was professor of law and then president of the university. Having nothing left to conquer in this country, he turned to China. In 2006, he was president of the Joint Center of the China-U.S. Law and, Public and Policies Institute. In 2007, he became founding dean and chancellor of the Peking University School of Transnational Law. In 2012, he became founding vice chancellor of the New York University Shanghai campus. Uh, Jeff's list of awards and honors and publications would take me longer to read than it will take for him to deliver his speech. So please join me in welcoming Jeff. Well. Uh, this is a very, very unusual opportunity for me uh, to be introduced by two friends. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Margaret. Um, by the way, Margaret, I spent time this afternoon with Ruth. <laughs> <coughs> Just so you know. <laughs> Truly, there can be no greater honor for me in the world than to have this opportunity to deliver the 20th annual Frank M. Coffin Lecture on Law and Public Service. The year 1981-82, when I served as one of the judge's law clerks, transformed me, and it transformed my life. The past 30 years for me have been profoundly shaped by my year living here in Portland and working for the judge. After the judge passed away, the University of Maine Law School was kind enough to publish some remarks that I delivered to my students in China about the example that the judge had set for me as a perfectionist, as a hard worker, as a lover of language, as a person who believed in the importance of all people, as a person who loved to have fun, 
and as a Renaissance man. He was all of those things and more. Those are qualities that often spring to my mind when I find myself seeking guidance and comfort in the question, what would the judge do? Until this evening, however, I have not had the opportunity to speak about what is perhaps the most powerful, far-reaching example that Judge Coffin set for me and for others. I am speaking now about his lifelong dedication to public service. Everyone here is familiar with the contours of his professional career in military service, as a law clerk, in private practice, and then for a remarkable half century in Congress at AID, as ambassador to the OECD, and on the bench. This resume of his career might well be described as a public service CV simply by virtue of the fact that Judge Coffin chose to work for the United States government. 50 years in the employ of the United States government would, of course, on its own, justify us in calling his a public service career. The example of public service that Judge Coffin gave to us, however, far transcended the identity of his employer. Rather, I would suggest, it expressed itself in the approach that he took to carrying out the tasks that his various roles assigned him. As much as anyone I have ever known, Judge Coffin believed that his highest professional responsibility was to serve the public. In that respect, Judge Coffin was perhaps somewhat different from others who have worked as employees of the federal government. In the world of academia, there has emerged an area of scholarship that is known as public choice theory. This form of scholarship attempts to analyze the behavior of public servants as if they are all purely self-interested actors who want only to maximize their individual power and influence and have no interest in larger public values. Sad to say, I think we can all find examples of political behavior that actually fits this description all too well. Yet Judge Coffin's vision of public service and his approach to his work made him a perfect counterexample, a case that proves that this kind of public choice analysis is at best very incomplete. Never once did I witness the judge think about a case or speak about a case in self-interested public choice terms. For example, as a vehicle that might have increased the likelihood that he could be appointed to the Supreme Court or anything like that. And when the judge spoke with us, his clerks, about his career before he was appointed to the court, as often as not, it was to reminisce about a moment when he had acted against his own self-interest. The form of the judge's reminiscence was almost always self-deprecating. With a smile and a twinkle in his eye, he would say things along the lines of, tell me, don't you think I was a fool to tell the Vice President of the United States that I disagreed with him on that point of public policy when I knew that he would have power over my future career? <laughs> and in such cases when he was talking to us, the judge was very skillfully teaching us to draw the opposite conclusion. What he was saying through this laughter and through these words was, my responsibility was to serve the cause of good public policy, not to flatter those in power. In the end, things turned out well for me, Judge Coffin, but even if they hadn't, I at least knew that I was being true to my own sense of duty. So 
with Judge Coffin as my inspiration, I'd like to spend some time this evening reflecting on the question, if public service means something more than just having a government employer, or even an NGO employer, then what does it really mean? And I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about the word public in the phrase public service. Who exactly are the members of the public that we are supposed to serve when we commit ourselves to public service? Who gets to decide what constitutes that public? I'm going to suggest to you that this word public is not a word whose definition falls down from the sky. Rather, it is a word that each of us has the power to define for ourselves. And I will then suggest that today, in the 21st century, we really should choose to define that word public broadly. I'm going to suggest that we should be thinking of our public in terms that are not local, parochial, partisan, or even national, but rather in terms that embrace the entire world. So when I say that I am engaged in public service, what exactly do I mean? A good starting point would be to say that the word public means not private. Private service would be work that benefits me or some person that I know and care about. It would also include work that I do for someone else who wants to use my work for his or her own benefit only, or for the benefit of some family member of theirs. Public service goes further. Public service requires us to imagine a community that is larger than individuals, their relatives, and their closest friends. Whether or not a public community must include total strangers, it surely has to include people who fall outside the tight circle of my family and my close friends. So let me give you a specific example. The apartment I am living in in New York City is one for which I pay rent to a landlord. But not all New York apartments are like that. In fact, New York is filled with living communities that are defined as co-ops. Co-op is owned by a corporation, and the residents of the co-op are its shareholders. They live in their own spaces, and they assess themselves fees to cover the costs of maintaining the infrastructure and the public spaces and providing public services to the building. Co-ops are governed by boards of directors. Board members generally serve without pay, and they are expected to exercise their authority in ways that serve the interests of all the building's tenants. They're not supposed to take actions that benefit themselves, their family, or their friends at the expense of other tenants. So here's the question. Should we think of service on a co-op board as public service? Now, some people might find this label troubling for two reasons. First, the community that is being served is rather small. And more significantly, it is quite clearly not a community that is somehow defined by reference to a spirit of altruism. This is a community of people with a shared interest in the quality of their own lives and the value of their own property. Nonetheless, I want to say that I believe that co-op board service is a form of public service. The community is large enough to include, if not total strangers, at least relative strangers, people with whom one has no bonds of affection. Service on a board like this calls for acts of imagination and stewardship. Co-op board directors are expected to imagine the lives and the interests of those relative strangers, and they are expected to act in ways that help those relative strangers, even if that is an action 
that they would not have taken if they wanted to promote only their own self-interest. So to put it slightly differently, I believe that co-op boards are engaged in an activity that is of service to a public. So its members are required to make public policy. And in that role, they should aspire to follow the example of Judge Coffin with the Vice President. They should place their own commitments to good public policy ahead of their own private objectives. So this should give you the sense that I want to define public service quite broadly to include any activities that require us to imagine a community of people beyond family and friends and to act on their behalf rather than our own. Now, when we reflect on this example of a co-op board, it becomes clear that when we think of a public that is beyond family and friends, we're also not thinking about some random collection of people. We're using the term public to refer to a community in which we are members, a collection of people with whom we share some common interests. And that leads us naturally to wonder, what is it that makes us feel identified with another person who's not a friend? What is it make us, that makes us feel that we share common interests? This question is especially important in the contexts of free and liberal societies like our own, like the United States. For hundreds of years, thoughtful writers uh, about life in these societies have fret that there's a risk that this kind of life in a tolerant and liberal society, an individualistic society, might lead people to become isolated from each other. An individualistic commercial culture might lead people to turn inwards, to give up some essential elements of our humanity that are actually associated with our feelings of connection to other people. Alexander de Tocqueville worried that if people spent all their time worrying about their own business affairs, they would develop what he called a kind of individual selfishness, which is like rust in society. He thought it was important for people to take the opportunity to develop feelings of connection that link us to people beyond family and close friends. By engaging sympathetically with other people, he said we maintain a kind of moral health for ourselves, and also for the community as a whole. The community as a whole is healthier when people feel this kind of sympathy and identification for people beyond their tightest circle. De Tocqueville admired 19th century America enormously, in part because he saw such a rich tapestry of voluntary associations here in America. America was filled with people banding together into groups that are larger than family in order to achieve a greater good. Many of the associations that he observed in the 19th century were churches, and churches undoubtedly played a salutary, salutary role in drawing people out of their family shells into a broader world of public service. Now, I want to pause and note that a critical feature of the world that Tocqueville was admiring and the associations that he was admiring had to do with their voluntariness. People were not forced into these associations. They decided on their own to take an affirmative step to reach out and bond with others, to identify them as similar to themselves, and to work with them to promote a common good. That personal choice, that affirmative step, was a vital aspect of the process that bound people together in a web of interdependence. 
It helped to reinforce the psychological benefits that people experienced as joint participants in a particular kind of community life. And it motivated them to give their very best efforts to the cause of public service. Now, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, I think it's reasonable to ask the following question. Is the uniquely American structure of voluntary associations, the one that Tocqueville was so struck by, being eroded today? Certainly, the amount of time that the average American spends in a church context is in rapid decline. Similarly, local organizations like the Rotary Club or the Elks Club seem to be having more and more difficulty attracting members. This is surely due in part to the ever-increasing busyness that modern life seems to have brought us. The work week grows relentlessly longer, and our time for anything unrelated to our employment becomes more and more scarce. Within families, today every adult is likely to work outside the home, which means the total time available for household production and engagement with children has declined dramatically. And so we just have less of ourselves left to give to these Tocquevillian voluntary associations. These shifts are compounded by changes in the technology of entertainment. For example, prosperity and technological development have brought us ever larger and flatter television screens. More and more, we think of sporting events and movies as things to be watched from within the privacy of one's own home. Such activities are shared with strangers a smaller and smaller percentage of the time. I suspect that these shifts would have alarmed de Tocqueville. But modern life has also brought us other changes that might perhaps be somewhat more ambiguous. How would de Tocqueville have felt, I wonder, about the new technologies of communication? How would he have felt about email, the internet, cell phones, text messaging, and social media? On the one hand, these technologies make it much easier for us to be in nearly constant communication with people who are not members of our families or part of a small circle of our closest friends. Facebook enables us to have hundreds of so-called friends. LinkedIn enables us to have an equally impressive number of connections. An ordinary person can reach out and touch thousands of people through tweets. And if one's name is Kardashian, one can reach out and touch millions of people in this way. Now, on the one hand, I believe de Tocqueville might approve of the way that these technologies can draw us outward from small cocoons into which we might otherwise withdraw. They do have the potential to serve as checks against isolation. On the other hand, de Tocqueville might worry that these social media technologies carry the risk of transforming our social relationships from few but very deep to many but very shallow. Consider the following rather typical exchange among today's youth. Hey, what's up? Not much, you? Not much, gotta go. <laughs> now, it seems that this rather empty exchange does give its participants a certain sense of connection to one another. It does nurture a certain kind of mutual identification. The harder question, and honestly it's an open question in my mind, is whether it provides a sufficient connection to prevent the kind of rust that de Tocqueville warned against. Does this kind of exchange 
move its participants to be less selfish? Does it generate a sense of community, a sense of public that people could associate with a norm of service? For now, I want to be hopeful. So let's assume that the human species is in essence a smart species. Let's assume that if our tweets are contrary to our interest in making meaningful connections with others, we will stop tweeting. Let's assume that if our Facebook pages and our LinkedIn communities bring us more stress than joy, we'll shut them down. So with these assumptions then in the background, it becomes possible for us to ask a slightly different question. If the modern world differs from the 19th century world in that we are less likely than we once were to define our community, the public that we are drawn to serve as our church or our immediate physical neighbors, then how exactly are we likely to define those terms of community and public today? Or more pointedly, how should we try to define those terms for ourselves? This is a fundamentally important question for our times. If we are to lead fully satisfying lives as individuals, and if taken together, we are to be a healthy society, then we need to find ways to define communities that we engage in the spirit of service. So let's start with the idea that this question of community, this question of what public should mean, what public we should wish to serve, should be thought of as a matter of personal choice. Early in the 20th century, the philosopher John Dewey wrote a number of essays about modern liberalism and modern democracy and what those concepts entail. And for Dewey, the best societies were ones that give individuals the freedom to make choices so that their lives might flourish. At the same time, Dewey wanted people who have these choices to appreciate that their own personal flourishing as a result of these choices is not automatic. It depends upon the opportunities that are granted to us by living within a community. Do we wanted people to appreciate that these opportunities will not continue automatically, they will continue only if people are committed to civic participation. They continue only if people are committed to defining the community as one whose structures and values will enable all of its members to prosper. In his book, Outlines of a Critical Theory of Ethics, Dewey expressed these notions in the following words. In the realization of individuality, there is found also the needed realization of some community of persons of which the individual is a member. And conversely, the agent who duly satisfies the community in which he shares by that same conduct satisfies himself. In 21st century America, we enjoy the special freedom to chart our own paths. Whereas in feudal England, people were chained to the land of their birth, we are given the privilege of choosing where we live, who we live with. We're given the opportunity to define ourselves politically and socially. And over the course of our lives, we are free to change our minds. This freedom carries with it responsibility. Each of us has a responsibility to make a choice about how we want to define our public and our community and I believe that we can make that choice more or less wisely. In an essay entitled The Public and Its Problems, John Dewey wrote about how we ought to define the public in an era of modern liberalism and modern democracy. He understood 
that each of us is likely to choose to belong to several different communities at the same time, communities that may overlap with one another. That is great. But he also offered us an overarching way to think about a concept of the public that did not depend on the particular choices people made about which communities to join. Dewey suge suggested that we should focus on one key question. That has to do with the way that our activities affect others. Obviously, when we interact with another person, that interaction is going to have an impact on that person and on ourselves. But sometimes, when we interact with another person, that interaction is going to affect third parties. Dewey said, we need to always think of those third parties who are affected by our actions as part of our public. He wrote, the public consists of all those who are affected by the indirect consequences of transactions to such an extent that it is deemed necessary to have those consequences systematically cared for. This quotation really brings me to my central point this evening. I believe that we should follow Dewey's guidance and think about whether and how our actions have indirect effects on others and how other people's actions have indirect effects on us. I believe it makes sense for us as a general matter to define our public as a kind of a soft circle that includes everyone whose actions affect us even indirectly as well as everyone who is affected by our actions. Today, to an extent unprecedented in human history, that means we should be defining our public in terms that span the entire world. I'd like to take a few brief minutes to review the factors that caused over the past 40 years the set of truly revolutionary changes that we call globalization. 40 years ago, nations, were hugely powerful actors. Today, the power of nations has been profoundly undermined. This shift came about because of political, technological, and cultural changes, and it requires us to think in new ways about the answer to Dewey's question, whose actions affect us and who is affected by our actions. The political and economic changes over the past 40 years have had to do primarily with the free movement of capital and free trade. After World War II and up until 1971, the Bretton Woods agreements gave national governments a lot of power and a lot of flexibility to control capital and trade in order to manage their economies. National governments set the value of their own currencies. National governments managed capital flows in and out of their countries. The International Monetary Fund helped to bridge currency reserve imbalances. During this time period, nations also had a lot of policy tools available with respect to their economies. They could run deficits. They could print money and accept inflation. They could interfere with free trade. The general agreement on tariffs and trade was a weak instrument with lots of areas that it left untouched. So tariffs were still a very big part of the scene, as were export restrictions, import quotas, and subsidies. The trend over the 40 years since 1971 has been to reduce dramatically the power of national governments to regulate the movement of capital, goods, and services. The first step was the abandonment of the gold standard. In response to overwhelming market pressures, Richard Nixon announced that the dollar would no longer be convertible to gold at the rate of $35 per ounce, and soon currencies were traded freely on markets for foreign exchange. During the 1970s and 80s, developed countries lifted virtually all of their controls on capital, 
And during the 1990s, as part of what was called the Washington Consensus, key institutions of international finance pressured developing countries to remove their capital controls as well. Meanwhile, in the world of tariffs and trade, the multinational system known as GATT kept expanding. It came to include more and more countries. And whereas the early rounds were primarily a mechanism through which the members would all agree to lower tariff rates at the same time, the Kennedy and Tokyo rounds began to prohibit countries from using so-called non-tariff barriers, such as anti-dumping rules. The Uruguay round reached out to promote trade liberalization with regard to export subsidies, intellectual property, in, uh, subsidies generally, services, and foreign investment. And finally, it created a WTO with much greater power to enforce its decisions against nations in the area of trade liberalization. So at the same time that national power was being reduced by a philosophy of free movement of capital, we also had technological and cultural changes that were having an equally important impact. On the technology side, improvements such as containerization and infrastructure investments such as transoceanic fiber optic cable were reducing transportation and communication costs. Food could travel much longer distances without spoiling, and on and on and on. On the cultural side, English suddenly emerged as a truly global commercial language. The result of all of these changes was an astounding increase in the pace of movement of just about everything, movement of capital, movement of goods, movement of services, movement of workers, but even more than that, movement of diseases, movement of pollution, movement of ideas, movement of cultural fads, movement of terrorists. With all of this new movement has come both interdependence and independence. We are today vastly more dependent on people who are far away from us than ever before. We are also vastly more independent of the authority of our own governments than ever before. That combination of interdependence and independence is for me what globalization means. Globalization has raised a whole set of very difficult challenges for us. It has made it more difficult for us to force markets to be humane, to care about workers, to care about the environment. In many countries, it has triggered powerful domestic political pressures to shrink the size of government. It has meant that many of the risks to the global economy have become more highly correlated and dangerous. When a problem emerges, as it did in the financial sector five years ago, the entire world is much more vulnerable. Finally, globalization has made it ever more difficult to preserve distinct cultural identities in a world of labor migration. In addition to all of these challenges that have come with globalization, however, there have come a set of new opportunities for humanity that are simply breathtaking. If I may, I'd like to illuminate these new opportunities by reference to my own experience over the past five years living in China. You should understand that I am not what one would ordinarily think of as a China person. Fifteen years ago, I had never set foot in China, and I knew virtually nothing about the country. My impressions of China at that time were quite vague, and candidly, they were not very optimistic. In 1998, when I first visited China in response to a US State Department request that I participate in a project to support the development, in 1998, I first visited China in response to uh, a request from the State Department to participate in a project to support the development of the rule of law in China. In 2007, I agreed 
to help Peking University create a new law school that would teach American rule of law values to the young people who are China's best hope for the future. From 2008, when this school opened until last summer, I lived and worked in South China, helping to launch the Peking University School of Transnational Law. In their first year, students at this school study the American common law, property, torts, contracts, criminal law. They learn about trial by jury. They learn about innocent until proven guilty. Bob Hershon, a Mainer who some of you know, who served as president of the American Bar, Bar Association, comes every year to teach these students about professional responsibility. At this very moment, another former president of the American Bar Association named Mike Greco is there in Shenzhen, China, teaching these students about international human rights and the International Criminal Court. Next month, Mark Rosenbaum, who is the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California, will be back yet again. He comes every year to teach an enormously popular course on freedom of speech. <laughs> Why is this happening now? It's because, as I mentioned before, we are now living in a globalization era where ideas move and we are witnessing the emergence of a more unified transnational legal profession that is not rigidly divided according to national borders. This past summer, I moved from the southern end of China up to Shanghai to help New York University's new degree-granting campus in that city. Next year, the first class of students will enroll at NYU Shanghai. Half the students will be Chinese. The other half will come from the rest of the world. I'm going to be teaching all of them a required first year course in intellectual history. We'll all be studying authors like de Tocqueville and Dewey, along with Confucius and Mencius. During the course of their education, all of the students will also be spending time outside of China, elsewhere in New York University's global network in New York City or on another of the school's 14 campuses around the world. These two projects have led me to see firsthand the kind of hope and possibility that globalization holds out for humanity alongside the challenges. The students and the professors who participate in these educational adventures all come away with an appreciation for several powerful facts. First, cultural differences are really tiny when compared with the overwhelming similarities that unite all humanity. Second, when students from different cultures are studying side by side, they all develop a deeper appreciation for the differences that do exist, a sense that these differences help to make life more interesting. And third, the most daunting challenges that we are facing in the 21st century whether we're talking about climate change or energy scarcity or economic inequality or disease, all of these challenges transcend national borders. These are all challenges that we have to solve together. So I believe that when we apply John Dewey's test today, there can be no doubt that what happens in China affects each of us and vice versa. We are all part of a worldwide public. And I believe we should be thinking about public service as worldly public service. It's clear to me that the University of Maine Law School is analyzing legal education for worldly public service in exactly this way. Permit me to note just a few examples. Under globalization, it is a fact that data networks no longer stop at national borders. The cloud that, surround, that exists surrounds the entire planet. So we and our worldwide public need to think carefully about how to preserve notions of privacy in such an environment. The University of Maine Law School is taking the lead in helping its students to engage these questions so that they might be well prepared 
to provide such service to a worldwide public. Similarly, we are all affected by problems of international migration, international slave trafficking, and international human rights. Again, the University of Maine Law School has chosen to initiate a refugee and human rights clinic. Third, our oceans are no longer simply boundaries that separate nations from one another. Rather, they need to be thought of as the connectors that link us to the rest of the world. The University of Maine Law School's Center for Oceans and Coastal Law is designed to encourage this manner of thinking. Once we all begin to think in this way about a worldwide public, I believe that we will be well prepared to live out the highest ideals of worldwide public service. This kind of public service has the possibility of improving the lives of others. But just as importantly, it has the possibility of improving our own lives. This kind of service connects us to others. It deepens our sentiments of sympathy and identification. It allows us to understand ourselves as full participating members in the community of 21st century humanity. It ennobles us in a way that I am confident would have made Judge Frank M. Coffin very proud. Thank you very much. So uh, we do have a little bit of time. If anyone has any questions, um, I think since this is being taped, uh, please come and ask the question at the microphone. Check, check. That one works. Uh, racism should not refer to persons stereotyping people. That's always going to happen. People have their spheres of experience. They see something outside that normal arena. They may not analyze it very carefully. I think the word racism refers to government practices. And so I understand racism as a, <clears throat> I can't even say a pseudo, I'll call it a pseudo legal idea. It, it's legal in that it, it uses government coercion to treat people uh, oppressively, some people oppressively, well, to exert government power against some people. But it's, it's not legal in that it is not very rational. For instance, it's very difficult. Somebody made a joke. There was a joke apparently circulating in the uh, Third Reich uh, about the pure Aryan stock. And they said, well, you look at uh, Hitler and Goebbels and Goering and uh, uh, Himmler. None of them had blonde hair. None of them had a cleft chin. Do you think if, if racism as a legal institution or an anti-legal institution, what do you think of the future of racism in the world? Does it have a destiny? Does it have a future? So it's a very interesting question. And it's a question that I think uh, is made more profound by these processes of globalization that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, we do live in an era where people move much, much more than ever before. Uh, the notion that I, who grew up in Maryland, would end up living halfway around the world in China is something that would have been almost unfathomable before this generation unless I was a missionary or something like that. We are living in a world now where people do move and people do mingle and mix. 
And I should say that uh, I believe that this process of mingling and mixing uh, is our best hope for the end of racism. Racism thrives when people are talking about people they don't know as individuals, as persons, as human beings. And I would say not only racism, I would say general stereotyping. I think that uh, one of the most remarkable things in my lifetime uh, happened last week in Maine. When I never, the election about marriage, the election about, about marriage equality, uh, I never would have imagined that that would have happened uh, in my lifetime. Uh, and the reason it happened is because today it is so common for people who are straight to know people who are gay and to say, wow, they're just like me. And that is why what had previously been a system that denied gay people the same opportunities that straight people had uh, is coming to an end. Um, I do believe that as long as we keep open borders, open opportunities for movement, the prospects for this kind of racism, discrimination uh, will continue to decline. I should just add a note that I am quite concerned about our national immigration policy uh, and how difficult it is becoming uh, for people born outside the United States uh, to come here. Um, probably 95% uh, of the people in this room uh, have uh, ancestors a few generations back uh, from a different country. That to me has been the story of the American dream and American success and to the extent we are now making it harder for people to participate in that in this century, I, I, uh, I'm distressed by that. Thanks for the question. If there are any other questions, please, please come forward if you can. <laughs> Sorry, all the way from the back. Um, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I work as an educator in Western China, and I was wondering if you could speak to um, the advantages and disadvantages of a global education in China and um, coming from a Chinese education system, which is very, very different from the U.S. education, um, like... Um, in my opinion, I think there are a lot of differences um, and a lot of similarities as well. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to, um, in your process of education in China, what you have found to be um, similarities and difficulties as well. Sure. Um, so uh, when, I, the, when I was asked by uh, Peking University to come help them, uh, and then when New York University was invited by Shanghai to create its school, um, there was the same spirit behind it, uh, which was a sense that China is interested in experimenting now with different forms of higher education than what it has had before. Uh, China, until recently, uh, didn't have much in the way of resources, and so the form of education that it used uh, was quite inexpensive and uh, uh, it involved lots of rote learning lectures. And the leadership of China uh, believes that that style of education, although it might uh, continue to have some value in elementary school, it's unclear about it in high school, and they're deeply concerned about its effectiveness when it comes to higher education, university education. So the goal of our law school was to bring American pedagogy into Chinese legal education. So, in American law schools, we teach using the Socratic method. Uh, the goal was to see how the Socratic method would work in preparing Chinese law students who had done all of their education, including their undergraduate education, under a system of lecture and rote learning before. Uh, it was remarkable 
The first few weeks were quite challenging for the students. Uh, they were not used to being called on. They were not used to, I mean, American students in law school aren't used to being called on either. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the, our, our students in China didn't know that, so they, they thought it was all because they were Chinese that this felt so different. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it took only a few weeks uh, for the students to take to it like ducks to water. Um, they love this form of education and uh, find that it develops critical thinking skills, creativity, uh, in just the same way that it does for students uh, here in America. With uh, NYU Shanghai, um, the goal here and the reason why the city of Shanghai invited NYU in uh, is to experiment with education, a different pedagogy at the undergraduate level. Instead of this rote learning, large lectures, which are the way I experienced actually higher education in France when I taught there uh, and studied there uh, a few decades ago. Instead of that style, they would like us to use liberal education, American style, uh, where students are taught to be active learners. They are expected to speak, to take chances in the classroom, to make mistakes, uh, and to learn from their own mistakes. Um, as is uh, the tradition, I would say, in China, uh, when reform efforts are undertaken, whether it's moving from a planned economy to a market economy or, or changing higher education, the model that is used is an experiment. Uh, let's try this out in one place first and see how it goes. And if it goes well, then we'll see if we can generalize it. So that's the uh, circumstance under which we are launching NYU Shanghai. That puts a little pressure on me, I must say. I feel like if we mess it up, uh, then maybe uh, China will never have uh, liberal education. That would be my fault. Uh, but uh, I don't think we're going to mess it up. I think it's going to work uh, extremely well. well. What could we learn from there? Is it going to be both ways? Uh, we do, we do expect that there will be a kind of interaction effect uh, that will benefit both countries, yes. Yes. I was wondering how you, uh, you've talked, spoke to public service on a global scale in general. I was wondering how you think the uh, view of public service differs in China and being a you know, different culture and having a very different political system. Sure, yeah, simple question. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's quite interesting, uh, terrific question actually. Um, and. Uh, I should again say I don't uh, speak Chinese, so I am answering your question based on conversations with our students in English, so they have translated Chinese concepts into the language of public service for me. Uh, but I will say that uh, one interesting difference is that uh, our students in China tend to think of public service as related to patriotism. They, to a person, love China, they love their country, but they do not love China as it happens to exist at this particular moment in time. They love a country that is changing dramatically, and they love the idea that it's getting better, and they love the idea that it can continue to get better into the future, and they feel a sense of patriotic duty to contribute to that process of evolution. And then the question for them is, what does that mean? To do that, to help that process go forward, do I work for the government? Do I work for an NGO? Do I work for a law firm? Do I work for a private business? Um, and they struggle. They struggle very hard with these questions. Um, of course, uh, Americans also struggle with this, these questions about what public service ought to mean and how we can do it. But I don't think that we tend to think of it quite in the same way as a matter of patriotism, patriotism patriotic duty. So I think that's the difference. Hi, uh, I would like to thank you for a great lecture. Uh, I have two questions. First, what is the impact of immigration on public service? Um, second question, as you know, we all lost him, so what's the uh, career advice they have for us? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Um, uh, so the impact of immigration on, on, on public service, uh, I, I, I guess I would say it's probably not necessarily a direct impact. Um, I think that uh, at one level, 
the issues surrounding immigration that I touched on earlier, which are matters of public policy, create opportunities for public service. Anytime we see a sense in which our community, our public, is not working optimally, there is an opportunity for public service. There is an opportunity for us to jump in, participate in the political process, uh, participate in informal cause advocacy, public education, uh, to try to help our public get to a better place. Uh, I would say that to the extent that uh, people agree with me that our immigration policy is suboptimal today, that does create opportunities for public contribution and public service in the name of changing that. It also creates different kinds of public opportunities. If you don't think about changing the law and you just think about immigration law as it operates today, that also creates opportunities to serve. Um, there are, for example, uh, deportation proceedings that are going on uh, all around America all the time, and those deportation proceedings have increased in frequency over the last four years. The question is, if someone is facing deportation, they are potentially facing uh, the near destruction of lives as they are experiencing them. It's a good thing if the students, uh, I mean, if the, if the person facing deportation uh, has counsel. Uh, they're not guaranteed a right to counsel. If they have counsel, the likelihood that they will be able to present all of the facts in a way that might persuade the authorities not to deport them goes up. So actually in Shenzhen, China, at the Peking University School of Transnational Law, there's a clinic called the Cross-Border Advocacy Clinic. People facing deportation in the United States can be represented by law students in China who are helping them to present their cases uh, to the immigration authorities, the Board of Immigration Appeals. Uh, so far, the school has uh, represented uh, one person who is facing deportation to Latin America, one person who is facing deportation to Africa, uh, one person who is facing deportation to, to uh, Europe. They've won every, every one of their cases so far. Um, so I think that's a way in which immigration has created possibilities for public service. I, um, as for the question about uh, career advice, professional advice um, for law students, uh, obviously uh, we are in an economy right now that is struggling. Uh, and it's struggling with respect to opportunities for law school graduates. Um, and it's um, scary uh, in many ways. I guess uh, what I would say uh, by way of advice is that the thing not to do is to assume that things will suddenly get better in the next two months or the next four months. I think it's going to take quite some time for the legal profession to adjust to the current economy. Uh, and I think what that means is law students need to be creative about their professional futures in a way that honestly I didn't have to be when I graduated from law school. When I graduated, there was a, a, a broad, wide highway going into the legal profession. That's not there anymore. That challenge and that need to be creative is, I will say, an opportunity. It's an opportunity because in order to think about what path you want to follow, you need to think in a much more personal way about what you want in life, about what your goals are, about what makes you happy, about where you want to be. Uh, and you can think about the trade-offs that you're gonna make as you try to develop an opportunity um, that fits uh, comfortably with your preferences and your desires and your dreams. When I was graduating from law school, students never thought about that. There was this broad highway uh, and there were large buses and you got on the bus and you went. And that's what you did. Uh, and uh, so it actually took uh, some people in my generation quite a while uh, to find their way off the bus 
uh, and to get back into the place where they really wanted to be. Uh, so it is a challenge, and I don't want to minimize that. I think it's, a, it's, it's not easy being a law student today, uh, but I would encourage you to, to look carefully at this element of opportunity that is embedded in it at the same time. Well, I'll, t I'll take that as an optimistic note on which to close the evening. Um, thank thank you, you very much, Jeff. Thank you.